Okay, we're going to be continuing Alcatraz vs. the Evil Librarians by Brandon Sanderson, Chapter 3. I'd like to take this opportunity to point out something important. Should a strange old man of questionable sanity show up at your door suggesting that he is your grandfather and that you should accompany him on some quest of mystical import, you should flatly refuse him. Don't take his candy, either. Unfortunately, as you will soon see, I was quickly forced to break this rule. Please don't hold it against me. It was done under duress. I'm really not used to being shot at. I walked tiredly into the kitchen, which still smelled of smoke, hoping that the strange old man wouldn't take to pounding on the door. I didn't really want to call the police on him. Not only would I likely break the telephone in the process, I'm particularly bad with phones, but I really didn't want the old loon carted away in a police car. That would have been Alcatraz Smedry, a voice suddenly asked. I jumped, turning from the half-burned cupboard, a box of cornflakes in my hand. A man stood in the doorway behind me wearing slacks and a button-down shirt. I frowned, realizing that I recognized the symbol on the man's shirt pocket in a standard-issue attaché case. He was a foster care caseworker. This was the man that Miss Fletcher had sent to pick me up from the house. I realized that I'd originally gone chasing the old man up to my room. I'd left the front door open. The caseworker must have come in looking for me while I was upstairs chatting with the lunatic. Hi, I said, putting down the box. I'll be ready in a bit. Let me have breakfast first. You're him, then? The caseworker asked, adjusting his horn-rimmed glasses. The Smedry kid? I nodded. Good, the man said, then pulled a gun out of his attaché case and raised it toward me. It had a silencer on the barrel. I froze, shocked. And don't try to claim that you did anything different the first time a government bureaucrat pulled a gun on you. Fortunately, I eventually found my tongue. Oh, wait, I said, raising my hands. What are you doing? Thanks for the sounds, kid, the man said and moved as if to pull the trigger. At that moment, something massive crashed through the wall of my house, something that looked a lot like the front of an old Model T Ford. I cried out, dodging to the side, and the caseworker stumbled to the ground in the chaos. The man who called him my, himself Grandpa Smedry sat happily in the driver's seat. A chunk of smoke-damaged ceiling fell down onto the hood of the car, throwing up a puff of white dust. The old man poked his head out the window. Lad, he said, might I point out that you have two choices right now. You can either get into the car with me, or you can stay here with the man holding the gun. I stood, dazed. You really don't have much time to decide. Grandpa Smedry said, leaning toward me, speaking in kind of a half-whisper, as if he were sharing some great secret. Now, I'd like to pause here and note that Grandpa Smedry was lying to me. I didn't only have two choices at that point, I had quite a few more than that. True, I could have chosen to stay in the room and get shot, I could have also chosen to get in the car. However, there were lots of other things I could have done. For instance, I could have run around the house flapping my arms and pretending that I was a penguin. The logical choice to make in this situation would have been to call the police on both of those maniacs. Unfortunately, I didn't think of penguins or police in the in and instead did as Grandpa Smedry said, scrambling over and getting into the car. As I stated at the beginning of this chapter, I really shouldn't have done this. I was soon to learn the dangers involved in following strange old men on quests. I don't want to give away any more of the story, but let me say that my fate at this point took a sharp turn toward altars, sacrifices, and evil librarians. And possibly some sharks. The car backed out of the house, the tires leaving tracks in the lawn. I sat in the front passenger seat, still stunned, looking at the wreckage of the Sheldon's house. Bits of siding were falling off outside the outside wall, crushing Roy's prized tulips. This was more damage than I'd ever done to any foster home. This time, it wasn't directly my fault, but, well, that didn't change the fact that the kitchen was no longer merely burned, but also had quite a large hole in it. We turned onto the street in front of the house, the car puttering along at a modest speed. The caseworker didn't chase after us, but that didn't stop me from watching anxiously until the house disappeared in the distance. Someone just tried to kill me, I thought, feeling numb. You may find it hard to believe, considering the number of things I've broken in my life, but this was the first time someone had actually tried to shoot me. It was an unsettling feeling, a little like the way you feel when you have the flu. Maybe there's a connection. Well, that was exciting, Grandpa Smedry said. I was still staring out the window. The street passed outside, a suburban neighborhood distinct and only, only in that it looked pretty much like every other one in the nation. Calm, two-story houses, green lawns, oak trees, shrubs, flower beds, all carefully maintained. He tried to kill me, I whispered. 
Grandpa Smedry snorted. Huh, not very well. You'll understand eventually, lad, but pulling a gun on a Smedry isn't exactly the smartest thing a man can do. But that's behind us. Now, we have to decide what to do next. Next? Of course! We can't just have the, let them have the sands! Grandpa Smedry raised a hand and pointed at me. Don't you understand, lad? It's not only your life that's in danger here. This is the fate of the entire world we're juggling. The free kingdoms are already losing their war against the librarians. With a tool like the Sands of Rashid, the librarians will have just the edge they need to win. If we don't get the sands back before they're smelted, which will only take a few hours, it could lead to the complete overthrow of the Five Kingdoms. We are civilization's only hope. I see, I said. I don't think that you do, lad. These lenses smelted from that sand will contain the most powerful oculatory distortions ever, ever either land has ever seen. Gathering those sands was your father's life work. I can't believe you let librarians steal them. I'll be honest, lad, I had higher hopes for you. I really expected better. If only I hadn't come so late. I sat quietly, looking out the windshield. Now, it's time you understood something about me. Despite what the stories like to say about my honor and my foresight, the truth is that I possessed neither trait in large amounts. One trait I've always possessed, however, is rashness. Some call it irresponsibility, others call it spontaneity. Either way, I call I, I could rightly be called a somewhat reckless boy, not always prone to careful considering the consequences of my actions. In this case, of course, there was something more behind the decision I made. I had seen some very odd things that day. It occurred to me that if something as crazy as a gunman showing up at my house could happen, perhaps it could be true that this old man was my grandfather. Someone had tried to kill me. My house was in shambles. I was sitting in a hundred-year-old car with a madman. What the heck? I thought. This might be fun. I turned, focusing on the man who claimed to be my grandfather. I didn't let them steal the sand, I found myself saying. Grandpa Smedry turned to me. Or, well, I did, I said, but I let them take the sand on purpose, of course. I wanted to follow them to see where they, what they tried to do with it. After all, how else are we going to uncover their dastardly schemes? Grandpa Smedry paused, then he smiled. His eyes twinkled knowingly, and I saw for the first time a hint of wisdom in the old man. Grandpa Smedry didn't seem to believe what I had said, but he reached over Henry anyway, clapped me on the arm. Now that's talking like a Smedry. Now, I said, holding up a finger, I want to make something very clear. I do not believe a word of what you have told me up to this point. Understood, Grandpa Smedry said. I... I'm only going with you because someone just tried to kill me. You see, I am somewhat reckless boy and I am not always prone to carefully considering the consequences of my actions. A Smedry trait for certain, Grandpa Smedry noted. In fact, I said, I think that you are a loon and likely not even my grandfather at all. Very well then, Grandpa Smedry said, smiling. I paused as the old car turned a corner, moving with a very smooth speed. We were leaving the neighborhood behind, turning onto a commercial street. We began to pass convenience stores, service stations, and the occasional fast food restaurant. It was at that point that I realized Grandpa Smedry had taken his hands off the wheel sometime during the conversation, and now sat with his hands in his lap, smiling happily. I jumped in surprise. Grandpa! I yelled. The steering wheel! Drastic drinks! Grandpa Smedry exclaimed. I nearly forgot. He grabbed the steering wheel as the car turned another corner. Grandpa Smedry proceeded to take the, turn the wheel back and forth, seemingly in random directions, as a child might play with a toy steering wheel. The car didn't respond to his motions, but moved smoothly along the street, picking up speed. Good eye, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. We always have to keep up appearances, huh? Uh, yeah, I said. Is the car driving itself, then? Of course. What good would it be if it didn't? Why, you'd have to concentrate so much that it wouldn't be worth the effort. Might as well walk, I say. Right, I thought. 
Those of you from the Free Kingdoms might be familiar with cinematic engines and can perhaps determine how they could be used to mimic a car. Of course, if you're from the Free Kingdoms, you probably only have a vague idea what a car is in the first place since you're used to much larger vehicles. It's kind of like a cinematic crawler with wheels instead of legs, though people treat them much more like horses. Only, unlike horses, they aren't alive, and when they poop, environmentalists get mad. So, I ask, where are we going? Well, there's only one place the librarians would have taken an artifact as powerful as the Sands of Rashid, Grandpa Smedry said. Their local base of operations. That would be... the library? Where else? The downtown library, to be exact. We'll have to be very careful infiltrating that place. I cocked my head. I've been there before. Last I checked, it wasn't too hard to get in. Oh, we don't just have to get in, Grandpa Smedry said. We have to infiltrate. And the difference is? The one requires far more sneaking. Grandpa Smedry seemed quite delighted at the prospect. Ah... I said, right then, are we going to need any, I don't know, special equipment for this? Or perhaps some more help? Oh, a very wise idea, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. And the car suddenly jerked, turning onto a larger street. Cars passed on either side, whizzing off to their separate destinations. Gamp Grandpa Smedry's little black automobile puttering along happily in the center lane. Grandpa gave the wheel a few good twists, and we rode in silence. I kept glancing at the steering wheel, trying to sort out exactly what mechanism was controlling the vehicle. In my world, vehicles don't drive themselves, and men like Grandpa Smedry are generally kept in small padded rooms with lots of crayons. Eventually, partially to keep myself from going mad from frustration, I decided to try conversation again. So, I said, why do you think that man tried to kill me? Oh, because the librarians got what they wanted from you, lad. Grandpa Smedry said. They have the sands, which we all know would make their way to you eventually. Now that they have your inheritance, you're no longer an asset to them. In fact, you're a threat. They were right to be afraid of your talent. My talent? Breaking things! All Smedrys have a talent, my boy. It's part of our lineage. So, uh, you have one of these talent things? I asked. Of course I do, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. I'm a Smedry after all. Well, what is it? Grandpa smiled modestly. Well, I don't like to brag, but it's a quite powerful talent indeed. I kept a skeptical r eyebrow raised. You see, Grandpa Smedry said, I have the ability to arrive late to things. Ah, I said, of course. I know, I know, I don't deserve such power, but I try to make good use of it. You are completely nuts, you know. I, it's always best to be blunt with people. Thank you, Grandpa Smedry said as the car began to slow. The vehicle pulled up to the pumps at the small gas station. I didn't recognize the brand. The sign hanging above the ridiculously high prices simply depicted the image of an upside-down teddy bear. Our doors swung open on their own. Grandpa hopped out of his seat and rushed over to meet the station attendant who was approaching to fill up the tank. I frowned, still sitting in the car. The attendant was dressed in a pair of dirty overalls and no shirt. He was chewing on the end of a piece of, a, of straw, and as one might see a farmer doing in the old Hushlander movies, and he had on a large straw hat. Grandpa Smedry approached the man with an exaggerated look of nonchalance. Hello, good sir. Grandpa Smedry said, glancing around. I'd like a Philip, please. Of course, good sir, the attendant said, tipping his hat and, and accepting a couple of bills from Grandpa Smedry. The attendant approached the car, nodding at me, and then took out one of the gasoline hoses and held it against the side of the car. There was, I noticed, no sign of a gas tank. The attendant stood happily, gas hose pressed uselessly against the side of the car, whistling pleasant to himself. Go, Malcatraz. Grandpa Smedry said, walking up to the gas station's store. There isn't time. Finally, I just shook my head and climbed out of the car. Grandpa Smedry went inside, the screen door slamming behind him. I walked up, pulled open the screen door, threw the hand door handle over my shoulder as it broke off, then stepped inside after Grandpa Smedry. Another attendant, also with straw in his mouth and a large hat on his head, stood leaning against the counter. The small store consisted of a single stand of snacks and a wall-sized cooler. The cooler was stocked completely with cans of motor oil, with, though a sign said, Enjoy a cool, refreshing drink. Okay, I said. 
Where exactly are you people finding straw to chew on in the middle of the city? It can't be all that easy to get. Quickly now, quickly. Grandpa Smedry gestured frantically from the side, from the back of the store. Glancing to either side, he said in a louder voice, I think I'll have a cool, refreshing drink. Then he pulled open the cooler door. I froze in place. Now, it's very important for me... <laughs> Now, it's very important to me that you understand that I am not stupid. It's perfectly all right if you end this book convinced that I am not the hero that some reports claim for me to be. However, I'd rather not everyone I meet presume me to be slow-witted. If that were the case, half of them would likely try to sell me insurance. The truth is, however, that even clever people can be taken by surprise by so soundly that they are at a loss for words. Or at least a loss for words that make sense. Yuck! I said. You see, now, before you judge me, place yourself in my position. Let's say that you had watched a crazy old man open up a cooler full of oil cans. You would have undoubtedly expected to see, well, a cooler full of oil cans on the other side. You would not expect to see a room with a large hearth at the center blazing with a cherry reddish orange flame. You would not expect to see two men in full armor standing guard on either side of the door. Indeed, you would not expect to see a room instead of a cooler full of oil cans at all. Perhaps you would have said Gak too. Gak! I repeated. Would you stop that boy? Grandpa Smedry said, There was absolutely no Gax here. Why do you think we'd keep so much straw around? Now come on. He stepped through the doorway and into the room beyond. I approached slowly, then glanced at the other side of the open glass door, and saw oil cans cooling in their wall racks. I turned, looking through the doorway. It seemed as though I could see much more than I should have been able to. The two knights standing on either side of such a small doorway should have left no room to walk through, yet Grandpa Smedry had passed easily. I reached out, rapping lightly on one of the knight's breastplates. Please don't do that, a voice said from behind the, the faceplate. Oh, I said, I I'm sorry. Still frowning to myself, I stepped into the room. It was a large chamber, far larger, I decided, than could have possibly fit in the store. I could now see a rug set with throne-like chairs arranged to face the hearth in a homey manner, if your home is a medieval castle. To my left, there was a long, broad table also set with chairs. Sing! Grandpa Smedry yelled, his voice echoing down a hallway to the right. Sing! If he breaks into song, I think I might have to strangle myself, I thought, cringing. Lord Smedry! A voice called out from down the hallway, and a huge figure rushed into sight. If you've never seen a large Mokian man in sunglasses, a tunic, and tights before... Okay, I'm going to assume that you have never seen a large Mokian man in sunglasses, a tunic, and tights. I certainly hadn't. The man, apparently named Singh, was a good six and a half feet tall and had dark hair and dark skin. He looked like he could be from Hawaii or maybe Samoa or Tonga. He had a massive girth of mass and girth of a linebacker and would have fit right in on a football field. Or at least he would have fit in if he had hadn't if he'd been wearing a football uniform rather than a tunic, a type of garment that I still think looks silly. Bastille has pictures of me wearing one. If you ask her, she'll probably show them to you gleefully. Of course, if you do that, I'll probably have to hunt you down and kill you, or dress you in a tunic and take pictures of you. I'm still not sure which is worse. Sing, Grandpa Smedry said. We need you to do a full library infiltration, now. A library infiltration, Sing said excitedly. Yes, yes, Grandpa Smedry said hurriedly. Go get your cousin. And both of you get into your disguises. I need to gather my lenses. Singh rushed back the way he had come. Grandpa Smedry walked over to the wall on the other side of the hearth. Not sure what else to do, I followed, watching as Grandpa Smedry knelt beside what appeared to be a large box made entirely of black glass. Grandpa Smedry put his hand on it and closed his eyes, and the front of the box suddenly shattered. I jumped back, but Grandpa Smedry ignored the broken shards of black glass. He reached into the chest and pulled out a tray wrapped in red velvet. He set this on top of the box, unwrapping the cloth and revealing a small book and about a dozen pair of spectacles, each with slightly different tint of glass. Grandpa Smedry pulled open the front of his tuxedo jacket and began to slip the spectacles into little pouches sewn into the lining of the garment. They hung like the watches on the inside of an illegal street peddler's coat. Something very strange is going on, isn't it? I finally asked. Yes, lad, Grandpa Smedry said still arranging the spectacles. We're really gonna sneak into a library? Grandpa Smedry nodded. 
only it's not really a library, but someplace more dangerous. Oh, it's really a library, Grandpa Smedry said. What you haven't realized before is that all libraries are far more dangerous than you've always assumed. And we're going to break into this one, I repeated. A place filled with people who want to kill me? Oh, most likely, Grandpa Smedry said. But what else can we do? We either infiltrate or we let them make those sands into lenses. This isn't a joke, I began to realize. This man isn't actually crazy, or at least the craziness included much more than just him. I stood there for a moment, feeling overwhelmed, thinking about what I had seen. Well, all right then, I finally said. Now, you Hushmanders may think that I took all of these strange experiences quite well. After all, it isn't every day that you get threatened with a gun, then discover a medieval dining room hidden inside a beverage cooler at a local gas station. However, maybe if you'd grown up with the magical ability to break almost anything you touched, then you would have been just as quick to accept unusual circumstances. Here, lad, Grandpa Smedry said, standing and picking up the final pair of spectacles. They were reddish tinted like the pair Grandpa Smedry was currently wearing. These are yours. Now I've been saving them for you. I paused. I don't need glasses. Oh, you're an oculator, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. You'll always need glasses. Can't I wear sunglasses? Like seeing? <laughs> Grandpa Smedry chuckled. <laughs> you don't need warrior lenses, lad. You can access abilities far more potent. Here, take these. They're oculator lenses. What are oculators? I asked. Who we are, my boy. Put them on. I frowned, but took the glasses. I put them on, then glanced around. Nothing looks different, I said, feeling disappointed. The room doesn't even look... redder. Well, of course not, Grandpa Smedry said. The tints come from the sands they're made of to help us keep the lenses straight. They're not intended to make things look different. I just... thought the glasses would do something? Oh, they do! Grandpa Smedry said. They'll show you things that you need to see. It's merely subtle, lad. Wear them for a while. You should let your eyes get used to them. All right. I glanced over it as Grandpa Smedry knelt to put the tray back inside the broken box. What's that book? Grandpa Smedry looked up. Hmm? This? He picked up the small book, handing it to me. I opened to the first page. It was filled with scribbles, as if made by a child. The Forgotten Language. Grandpa Smedry said. We've been trying to decipher it for centuries. Your father worked on that book for a while. Before you were born, he thought its secrets might lead him to the sands of Rashid. This isn't a language, I said. It's just a bunch of scribbles. Well, any language you don't understand would look like scribbles, lad. I flipped through the pages of the book. It was filled with completely random circles, zigzags, loop-de-loops, and the like. There were no patterns. Some of the pages only had a couple marks on them. Others were so black with ink that they looked like a child's rendition of a tornado. No, I said. No, I don't think so. A language has to make patterns. There's nothing like that in there. Well, that's the big secret, lad, Grandpa Smedry said, taking back the book. Why don't you think nobody, despite centuries of trying, has managed to break the code? The Incarna people, the ones who wrote this language, held vast secrets. Unfortunately, no one can read their records, and the Incarna disappeared many centuries ago. I wrinkled my brow at the strange comments. Grandpa Smedry stood up, stepping away from the glass box, and suddenly, the shattered front of the box melted and reformed its glassy surface. I stepped back in shock. Then I reached up, suspiciously pulling off my glasses. Yet the box still sat pristine, as if it had been, hadn't been broken in the first place. Restoring glass, Grandpa Smedry said, nodding toward the box. Only an oculator can break it. Once he moves too far away, however, it will reform into its previous shape. Makes for wonderful safes. It's even stronger than builder's glass, if used right. I slipped my lenses back on. Tell me, lad. Grandpa Smedry said, laying a hand on my shoulder. Why did you burn down your foster parents' kitchen? I started. That wasn't the question I'd been expecting. How did you know about that? Why, I'm an oculator, of course. I just frowned. So, why? He asked. Why did I burn it down? Yeah, it was an accident, I replied. Was it? I looked away. Uh, of course it was an accident, I thought, feeling a bit of shame. Why would I do something like that on purpose? Grandpa Smedry was studying me. 
You have a talent for breaking things, he said. Or so you have said. Yet lighting drapes on fire and ruining a kitchen with smoke doesn't seem like that like a use of that talent, particularly if you let that fire burn for a while before putting it out. That's not breaking. That seems more like destroying. I don't destroy, I said quietly. Why then? Grandpa Smedry said. I shrugged. What was he implying? Did he think I liked messing things up all the time? Did he think that I liked being forced to move every few months? It seemed that every time I came to love someone, they decided that my talent was just too much to handle. I felt a stab of loneliness, but shoved it down. Ah, Grandpa Smedry said. You won't answer, I see. But I can still wonder, can't I? Why would a boy do such damage to the homes of such kind people? It seems like a perversion of his talent. Yes, indeed. I said nothing. Grandpa Smedry just smiled at me, then straightened his bow tie and checked his wristwatch. Garbled greens, we're late. Sing, Quentin. We're ready, Uncle. A voice called from down the hallway. Ah, good, Grandpa Smedry said. Come on, boy. Let me introduce you to your cousins. Chapter 4. Hushlanders, I'd like to take this opportunity to commend you for reading this book. I realize the difficulty must have gone through to obtain it. After all, no librarian is likely to recommend it, considering the secrets it exposes about their kind. Actually, my experience has been that people generally don't recommend this kind of book at all. It is far too interesting. Perhaps you have other had other kinds of books recommended to you. Perhaps even you have been given books by friends, parents, or teachers, then told that these books are the types you have to read. Those books are invariably described as important, which in my experience pretty much means that they're boring. Words like meaningful and thoughtful are other good clues. If there's a boy in these kinds of books, he will go on to an adventure to fight against librarians, paper monsters, and one-eyed dark oculators. In fact, the lad will not go on an adventure or fight against anything at all. Instead, his dog will die, or in some cases, his mother will die. If it's a really meaningful book, both his dog and his mother will die. Apparently, most writers have something against dogs and mothers. Neither my mother nor my dog dies in this book. I'm rather tired of those types of stories. In my opinion, such fantastical, unrealistic books, books in which boys live on mountains, families work on farms, or anyone has anything to do with the Great Depression, have a tendency to rot the brain. To combat such silliness, I've written the volume you hold now, a solid, true account. Hopefully, it will help anchor you in reality. So when people try to give you some book with a shiny round award on the cover, be kind and gracious, but tell them that you don't read fantasy because you prefer stories that are real. Then come back here and continue your research on the cult of evil librarians who secretly rule the world. This, Grandpa Smedry proclaimed, pointing to Sing, is your cousin Sing Sing Smedry. He's a specialist in ancient weapons. Sing nodded modestly. He had exchanged his tunic for what appeared to be a formal kimono, though he still wore his dark sunglasses. The kimono was a very rich dark blue silk, and though it fit him quite well, there was something wrong about the entire presentation. More than just the fact that the kimono itself wasn't something an ordinary person in America wore, Singh's chest parted the front of the silk, and the loose garment hung tied around the waist with a large sash tucked underneath his massive stomach. Ah, uh, nice to meet you, Singh. Sing, I said. No, oh, you can just call me Sing, the large man replied. Ask him what his talent is, Grandpa whispered. Oh, I said. Um, what's your talent, Sing? I can trip and fall to the ground, Sing said. I blinked. That's a talent? Oh, it's not as grand as some I know, Sing said. But it serves me well. And the kimono, I asked. I come from a different kingdom than your grandfather, Singh said. I am from Mokia, while your grandfather and Quintin are from Nahala. Okay, I said, but what difference does that make? Oh, it means I have to wear a different disguise from the rest of you, Singh explained. That way, I won't stand out so much. If you look like a foreigner to America, people will ignore you. I paused. Whatever, I finally said. It makes perfect sense, Grandpa Smedry said. Trust me, we've researched this. 
He turned and pointed to the other man. Now, this is your cousin Quentin Smedry. Short and wiry, Quentin wore a sharp tuxedo that looked like that of Grandpa Smedry, complete with a red carnation on the lapel. He had dark brown hair, pale skin, and freckles. Like Singh, he looked to be about 30 years old. Well met, young oculator, Quentin said from behind his dark sunglasses. And what is your talent? I dutifully asked. I can see things that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. I thought everyone here had that talent, I noted. Nobody laughed. Free Kingdomers never get my jokes. He's really sneaky, Grandpa Smedry said. Quentin nodded. Great, I said. So are both of you oculators? Oh, goodness, no, Singh said. We're cousins to the Smedry family, not members of the direct line. Didn't you notice the glasses? Grandpa Smedry asked. They're wearing warrior's lenses, one of the only kinds of lenses that a non-oculator can use. Um... Uh, yeah, I said. Actually, I did notice the glasses. I noticed the tuxedos, too. Is there some reason you dress like that? If we walk around like this, we'll kind of stand out, right? Uh, maybe the young lord has a point, Singh said, rubbing his chin. Lord, I thought. I had no idea what that, what to make of that. Uh, should we get uh, Alcatraz a disguise, too, Lord Smedry? Quentin asked my grandfather. No, no. Grandpa Smedry said, He isn't supposed to wear a suit at his age. At least I don't think. I'm fine, I said quickly. The collection of Smedrys nodded. Now, many of you Hushlanders may be scoffing at the disguises used by the Smedry group. Before you pass judgment on them, realize that they were somewhat out of their element. Imagine if you were suddenly thrust into a different culture, with very little knowledge of its customs or fashion. Would you know the difference between a Roundsfield tunic and a Larkian tunic? Would you be able to distinguish when to wear a batold and when to wear a carfu? Would you even know where you wrap a Carl Florgian wicker strap? No? Well, that's because I just made those items up. But you didn't know that, did you? Therefore, my point is proven. All things considered, I think the Smedrys did quite well. I've seen other infiltration teams, ones without Grandpa Smedry, who is widely held as the Free Kingdomer's foremost expert on American culture and society. The last group that tried an infiltration without him ended up trying to sneak into the Federal Reserve Bank disguised as potted plants. They got watered. Are we ready then? Grandpa Smedry said. My grandson will be leading this infiltration. Our target is the central downtown library. Sing and Quentin glanced at each other, looking a bit surprised. Grandpa had mentioned a library infiltration to Sing, but apparently the downtown library was not what he'd expected. It made me wonder, once again, what I was getting myself into. I realize that this will be a most ambitious mission, gentlemen, Grandpa Smedry said. But we have no choice. Our goal is to recover the legendary sands of Rashid, which the librarians have acquired through some very clever scheming and plotting. Grandpa Smedry turned, nodding to me. The sands belong to my grandson, and so he will be lead oculator on this mission. Once we breach the initial stacks, we'll split into two groups and search for the sands. Gather as much information as you can and recover the sands at all costs. Any questions? Quentin raised his hand. What exactly does this bag of sands do? Grandpa Smedry wavered. We don't actually know. He admitted, before this, nobody had ever managed to gather enough of them to smelt to a lens. Or, at least, nobody had managed to do it during our recorded history. There are vague legends, however. These lenses of Rashid are supposedly very powerful. They will be of great danger to the people of the Free Kingdoms if they are allowed to fall into the librarian's hands. The room fell silent. Finally, Singh raised a meaty hand. Does this mean I can bring weapons? Of course, Grandpa Smedry said. Can I bring lots of weapons? Singh asked carefully. Whatever you deem necessary, Singh, Grandpa Smedry said. You're the specialist, but go quickly. We're going to be late. Singh nodded, dashing back down this hallway. And you? Grandpa Smedry asked of Quentin. I'm fine, the short man said. But, my lord, don't you think we should tell Bastille where, what we're doing? Jabbering Jordans, no, Grandpa Smedry said. Absolutely not. I forbid it. Well, she's not going to be happy, 
Quentin said. Nonsense, Grandpa Smedry said. She enjoys being ignored. It gives her an excuse to be grumpy. Now, since we have to wait for Singh to get his weapons, I'm going to go get something to eat. I was clever enough to pack some lunches for myself and the lad. Coming, Alcatraz? I shrugged and we made our way out through the cooler, passing the armored knights and walked back to the shop. Grandpa Smedry nodded to the two hillbilly attendants, then walked out toward his car, apparently going to grab the briefcases stuffed with food. I didn't follow him. At that point, I still felt a little overwhelmed by what was happening to me. Part of me couldn't believe what I had seen, so I decided to try out how they were hiding that huge room inside. I tried to figure out how they were hiding that huge room inside. I turned, wandering around to the back of the small service station, then I carefully paced off the links of its walls. The building was a rectangle, 10 paces long on two sides, 18 paces long on the other two. Yet the room inside had been far larger. A basement, I wondered? Yes, I realized that it took me quite some time to accept the place was magical. You free kingdomers really have no idea what it's like to live in librarian-controlled areas, so stop judging me and just keep reading. I kept at it, trying to figure out some logical explanation. I squatted down on the hot, tar-stained asphalt, trying to find a slope in the ground. I stood up, eyeing the back of the building, which was set with a small window. I grabbed a broken chair from the nearby dumpster, then climbed to peek inside the window. I couldn't see any si anything through the dark glass. I pressed my face against it, bumping my glasses against the window. This shaded and shaded the sunlight with my hand, but I still couldn't see inside. I leaned back, sighing, but then it seemed as if I could see something. Not through the window, but alongside it. The edges of the window seemed to fuzz a tiny bit and I got the distinct, strange impression that I could see through the wall siding. I pulled off my glasses, the illusion disappeared, and the wall looked perfectly normal. I put them back on, and nothing really changed. Yet, as I stared at the wall, I felt the odd sense again, as if I could just barely see something. I cocked my head, teetering on the broken chair. Finally, I reached up a hand, laying it against the white siding. Then, I broke it. I really didn't really do much. I didn't have to twist, pull, or yank. I merely rested my hand against the wall for a moment, and one of the siding planks popped free and toppled to the ground. Through the broken section, I could see that the true wall of the building. Glass. The entire wall was made of a dark lavender glass. I saw through the siding, I thought. Was it my glasses that let me do that? A footstep sounded on the gravel behind me. I jumped, almost slipping off the chair, and there he was, the man from my house. The caseworker, or whatever he was, with the suit and the gun. I wobbled, feeling terror rise again. Of course he would chase us. Of course he would find us. What was I thinking? Why hadn't I just called the police? Lad? Grandpa Smedry's voice called. He appeared around the corner, holding an open briefcase smeared with ketchup. Your sand burger is ready. Aren't you hungry? The man with the gun spun around, weapons still raised. Don't move! He yelled nervously. Stay right there! Huh? Grandpa Smedry asked, still walking. Grandpa! I screamed as the caseworker pulled the trigger. The gun went off. There was a loud crack, and a chunk of siding blew off the building right in front of Grandpa Smedry. The old man continued to walk along, smiling to himself, looking completely relaxed. The caseworker fired again, then again. Both times the bullets hit the wall right in front of Grandpa Smedry. Now, a true hero would have tackled the man who was shooting his grandfather, or done something else equally heroic. I am not a true hero. I stood frozen with shock. Here now, Grandpa Smedry said. What's going on? Looking desperate, the caseworker pointed the gun back at me and pulled the trigger. The consequences, of course, were immediate. The magazine dropped out of the bottom of the gun. The sliding part off the, on the top of the weapon fell off. The gun's trigger popped free, propelled by a broken spring. The screws fell out of the gun's side, dropping to the pavement. The caseworker widened his eyes in disbelief, watching as the last part of the grip fell to pieces in his hand. In a final moment of indignity, the dying man, the dying gun belched up a bit of metal, an unfired bullet, which spun in the air a few times before clicking down onto the ground. The man stared at the pieces of his weapon. Grandpa Smedry paused beside me. No, I think you broke it, he whispered to me. The caseworker turned and scrambled away. Grandpa Smedry watched him go, a sly smile on his lips. What did you do? I asked. Me? Grandpa Smedry said. No, you're the one who did that. At a distance, even. I've rarely seen a talent work with such power. Though, it's a shame to ruin a good antique weapon like that. I... I looked at the gun pieces, my heart thumping. It couldn't have been me. I've never done anything like that before. Have you ever been threatened by a weapon before today? Grandpa Smedry asked. 
Well, no. Grandpa Smidry nodded. Panic instinct. Your talent protects you, even from a distance, when threatened. It's a good thing that he attacked with such a primitive weapon. Talents are much more powerful against them. Honestly, you'd think the librarian would know not to send someone with a gun against the smedry of a true line. They obviously underestimate you. Uh, what am I doing here? I whispered, they're going to kill me. Nonsense, lad, Grandpa Smedry said. You're a smedry. We're made of tougher stuff than the librarians give us credit for. Ruling the Hushlands for so long has made them sloppy. I stood quietly, then I looked up. We're really going to go into the library, the place where these guys come from? Isn't that kind of stupid? Yeah, Grandpa Smedry said, speaking for once with a quiet solemnity. You can stay back if you wish. I know how you, this must all seem to you. Overwhelming. Terrifying. Strange. But you must understand me when I say all risk is vital. We've made a terrible mistake. I've made a terrible mistake by letting those sands get into the wrong hands. I'm going to make it right before thousands upon thousands of people suffer. But isn't there anyone else who could do this? Grandpa Smedry shook his head. Those sands will be forged into lenses before the day is out. Our only chance, the world's only chance, is to get to them before that happens. I nodded slowly. Then I'm going, I said. You can't leave me behind. I wouldn't dream of it, Grandpa Smedry said. Then he glanced up at the wall where I had broken it. You do that? I nodded again. Nagging Nixies! You really do have quite the skill for breaking things, Grandpa Smedry said. Must have been hard for you when you were younger. I shrugged. What kind of things can you break? Grandpa Smedry asked. All kinds of things, I said. Doors, electronics, tables. Once I broke a chicken. A chicken? I nodded. It was on a field trip. I got kind of frustrated and I picked up a chicken. And when I put it down, it immediately lost all of its feathers and from then on refused to eat anything but cat food. Breaking living things, Grandpa Smedry mumbled to himself. Extraordinary. Untamed, yes, but extraordinary nonetheless. I pointed at the building, hoping to change the subject. It's a glass box. Yes, Grandpa Smedry said. Expander's glass. If you make space inside of it, you can push out the walls inside without pushing out the walls on the outside. Uh, that's impossible. It disobeys the laws of physics. We Hushlanders pay a lot of attention to physics. That's just librarian talk, Mr. Grandpa Smedry said. You've, you've got a lot to learn, lad. Oh, come on, we need to get moving. We're late. I allowed myself to be led away, past the three bullet holes in the siding. They missed, I said, almost to myself. It's a good thing that man had such bad aim. Grandpa Smedry laughed. Bad aim. He didn't have a chance of hitting me. I arrive late to every shot. Your talent can do some great things, my boy, but it's not the only powerful ability around. I've been arriving late to my own death since before you were born. In fact, once I was so late to an appointment that I got there before I left. I paused, trying to work through that last statement, but Grandpa Smedry waved me on. We rounded the building. Quentin and Singh stood with one of the station attendants, talking quietly. Singh had a good dozen different guns strapped to his body. He wore two holsters on each leg, one holster around his upper arm and one underneath each arm. These were com complemented by a couple of Uzis tucked into his sash and what looked like a shotgun tied to his back as if it were a sword. Oh dear, Grandpa Smedry said. He's not supposed to show them off like that, is he? Ah, uh, no. Could we peace bomb them, you think? I don't know what that is, I said, but I doubt it would help. Still, after getting shot at, the sight of Singh with all those weapons did make me feel a little bit more comfortable. Until I realized that, if you're going to be bringing an arsenal like that, what would our enemies have? Oh, well, Grandpa Smitry said. I already told him he could bring them. We can hide them in a bag or something. They're really not that dangerous. It's not like he's got a sword or something. Anyways, we need to get moving. We're late. Yeah, I said. Yeah, I know. Good, then let's... At this point, you should be very annoyed with people getting interrupted mid-sentence. I assure you that I feel the same way. In fact, I think a silver sports car screeched into the parking lot. Its windows were tinted the deepest black, even the windshield, and it had a sleek, ominous design and make and model of which I couldn't quite place. It was like every spark spy car I had ever seen melded into one. 
The door burst open and a girl, about my age, jumped out. Her hair was silvery, matching the car's paint, and she wore fashionable black slacks and a silver jacket and carried a black handbag. She appeared to be very, very angry. Smittery! She snapped, swatting her purse at Singh, and he moved too slowly to get out of her way. What? I asked, jumping back slightly. Not you, lad, Grandpa Smedry said with a sigh. She means me. What? I asked. What did you do? Nothing much, Grandpa Smedry said. I just kind of left her behind. That's Bastille, lad. She's our team's knight. If I'd had any sense, I'd have run away right then. Chapter 5 At this point, perhaps you Hushlanders are beginning to doubt the truth of this narrative. You have seen several odd and inexplicable things happen, though let me warn you that the story so far has actually been quite tame. Just wait until we get to the part with the talking dinosaurs. Some readers might even think that I'm making the story up. You might think that everything in this book is dreamy silliness. Nothing could be further from the truth. This book is serious, terribly serious. Your skepticism results from a lifetime of training in the librarian school system, where you were taught all kinds of lies. Indeed, you'd probably never even heard of the Smedries, despite the, fight, despite the fact that they are the most famous family of oculators in the entire world. In most parts of the Free Kingdoms, being a Smedri is considered equivalent to being nobility. If you wish to perform a fun test, next time you're in a history class, ask your teacher about the Smedries. If you're teacher is a librarian spy, he or she will get red-faced and give you a detention. If, on the other hand, your teacher is innocent, he or she will be simply be confused, then likely give you a detention. Remember, despite the fact that this book is being sold as a fantasy novel, you must take all of these things it says extremely seriously, as they are quite important, are in no way silly, and always make sense. Rutabaga. That is a knight? I asked, pointing at the silver-haired girl. Unfortunately, Grandpa Smedry said. But she's a girl, I said. Yes, Grandpa Smedry said. And a very dangerous one, I might add. She was sent to protect me. Sent? I said. Who sent her then? And is she supposed to protect you from the librarians or from yourself? Bastille stalked right up to Grandpa Smedry, placed her hands on her hips, and glared at him. I'd stab you with something if I didn't know that you'd arrive too late to get hurt. Bastille, my dear. Grandpa Smedry said. How pleasant. Of course, I didn't mean to leave you behind. You see, I was running late, and I needed to go. Bastille held up her hand to silence Grandpa, then glared at me. Who is he? My grandson, Grandpa Smedry said. Alcatraz. Another Smedry? She asked. I have to try to protect four of you now? Bastille, dear, Grandpa Smedry said. No need to get upset. He won't be much trouble, will you, Alcatraz? Uh, no, I said. That was, of course, an absolute lie, but would you have said anything different? Bastille narrowed her eyes. Somehow I doubt that. What are you planning, old man? Nothing to worry about, Grandpa Smedry said. Just a little infiltration. Of? Bastille asked. The downtown library? Grandpa Smedry said, then smiled innocently. What? Bastille said. Honestly, I can't even leave you alone for half a day? Shattering glass! What would you make? What would make you want to infiltrate that place? Uh, they have the sands of Rashid, Grandpa Smedri said. So we've got plenty of sand. These sands are very important, Grandpa Smedri said. It's an oculator sort of thing. Bastille's expression darkened a bit at that comment. She threw her hands into the air. Whatever, she said. I assume we're late. Very, Grandpa Smedri said. Fine. She stabbed a finger at me. I barely suppressed a tense jump. You. Get in my car. You can fill me on on the mission. We'll meet you there, old man. Lovely, Grandpa Smedry said, looking relieved. Aye, I began. Must I remind you? Oh, must I remind you, Alcatraz, Grandpa Smedry said, that you shouldn't swear. Now, we're getting late. L get moving. I paused. Swear? I said. However, my confusion gave Grandpa Smedry a perfect chance to escape, and I caught sight of the man's eyes twinkling as he jumped into his car, Quentin and Singh joining him. For an old man who arrives late to everything, I noted, he certainly is spry. Come on, Smedry! Bastille growled, climbing back into her sleek car. 
I sighed, then rounded the vehicle and pulled open the passenger side door. I tossed the handle to the side as it broke off, then climbed in. Bastille wrapped her knuckles on the dashboard and the car started. Then she reached for the gear shift, throwing it into reverse. Uh, doesn't the car drive itself? I asked. Sometimes, Bastille said. It can do both. It's a hybrid. We're trying to get closer to the things that look like real Hushlander vehicles. With that, the car burst into motion. Now, I had been very frightened on several different occasions in my life. The most frightening of these involved an elevator and a mine. Uh, perhaps the second most frightening involved a caseworker and a gun. Bastille's driving, however, quickly threatened to become number three. Aren't you supposed to be some sort of bodyguard? I asked, furiously working to find a seatbelt. There didn't appear to be one. Yeah, Bastille said. So? So, shouldn't you avoid killing me in a car wreck? Bastille frowned, spinning the wheel and taking a corner at a ridiculous speed. I don't know what you're talking about. I sighed, settling into my seat, telling myself that the car probably had some sort of mystical device to protect its occupants. I was wrong, of course. Both oculator powers and cinematic technologies have to do with glass, and I seriously doubt that an airbag made of, or filled with, glass would be all that effective. Amusing, perhaps, but not effective. Hey, I said, how old are you? Thirteen, Bastille replied. Should you be driving, then? I asked. I don't see why not. You're too young, I said. Says who? Says the law. I could still ba see Bastille narrow her eyes and her hands grip the wheel even tighter. Maybe librarian law, she muttered. This, I thought, is probably not a topic to pursue further. So, I said, trying something different. What is your talent? Bastille gritted her teeth, glaring out through the windshield. Well, I asked. You don't have to rub it in, Smedry. Great. You don't have a talent, then? Of course not, she said. I'm a Christian. A what? I asked. Bastille turned, an action that made me rather uncomfortable, as though I thought she should have kept watching the road, and gave me the kind of look that implied that I had just said something very, very stupid. And indeed, I had said something very stupid. Fortunately, I made up for it by doing something rather clever, as you'll see shortly. Bastille turned her eyes back on the road just in time to avoid ruining over a man dressed like a large slice of pizza. So you're really him, then? The one old Smedry keeps talking about? This intrigued me. He's mentioned me to you? Bastille nodded. Twice a year or so, we have to come back to this area and see where you've moved. Old Smedry always manages to lose me before he actually gets to your house. He claims I'll stand out or something. Tell me, did you really knock down one of your foster parents' houses? I shifted uncomfortably. That rumor is exaggerated, I said. It was only a storage shed. Bastille nodded, eyes narrowing, as if for some reason she had a grudge against sheds to go along with her apparent psychopathic dislike of librarians. So, I said slowly, how does a 13-year-old girl become a knight anyways? What's that supposed to mean? Bastille asked, taking a screeching corner. And here's where I proved my cleverness. I remain silent. Bastille seemed to relax a bit. Look, she said, I'm sorry, I'm not very good with people. They annoy me. That's probably why I ended up in this job that lets me beat them up. Is that supposed to be comforting? I wondered. Plus, she said, you're a smedry, and smedries are terrible. They're reckless, and they don't like to think about the consequences of their actions. That means trouble for me. See, my job is to keep you alive. It's like, sometimes you smedries try to get yourself killed just so I'll get in trouble. I'll try my best, best to avoid something like that, I said honestly, though her comment did spark a thought in my head. Now that I had begun to accept the things happening around me, I was actually beginning to think of Grandpa Smedry as, well, my grandfather. And that meant my parents, I thought. They might actually be involved in this. They might actually have sent me that bag of sands. They would have been Smedry's too, of course. So were they some of the ones that got themselves killed, as Bastille so pu nicely put it? Or, like all these other relatives I was suddenly learning I had, were my parents still around somewhere? That was a depressing thought. A lot of us foster children don't like to consider our, or ourselves orphans. It's an outdated term, in my opinion. It brings to mind images of scrawny, dirty-faced thieves living on the street and getting meals from good-hearted nuns. I wasn't an orphan. I had lots of parents. I just never stayed with any of them that, all that long. I'd rarely bothered to consider my real parents, since Miss Fletcher had never been willing to answer questions about them. Somehow, I found the prospect of their survival to be even more depressing than when the thought of them being dead. Why did you burn down your foster parents' kitchen, lad? Grandpa Smedry had asked. I quickly turned away from that line of thinking, focusing again on Bastille. 
She was shaking her head, still muttering about Smedries who get themselves into trouble. Your grandfather, she said. He's the worst. Normal people avoid inner Libraria. The librarians have enough minions in our own kingdoms to be plenty threatening. But Leavenworth Smedry? Fighting them isn't nearly dangerous enough for him. He has to live as a spy inside of the Shattering Hushlands themselves. And of course he drags me with him. Now he wants to infiltrate a library. And not just any library, but the regional headquarters. The biggest library in three states. She paused, glancing at me. You think I have good reason to be annoyed? Definitely. I said, again proving my cleverness. That's what I thought, Bestile said. Then she slammed on the brakes. I smashed against the dash, nearly losing my glasses. I groaned, sitting back. What? I asked, holding my head. What, what? Bestile said, pushing open the door. We're here. Oh. I opened the door, dropping the inside handle to the street as it came off of my hand. This kind of thing becomes second nature to you after you break off your first hundred or so door handles. Bastille had parked on the side of the street directly across from the downtown library, a wide, single-story building on set on a street corner. The area around us was familiar to me. The downtown area wasn't extremely huge, not like that of a city like Chicago or LA, but it did have a smattering of large office buildings and hotels. These towered behind us. We were only a few blocks away from the city center. Bastille wrapped the hood of the car. Go find a place to park, she told it, immediately started up, then backed away. I raised an eyebrow. Handy that. I noted. Like Grandpa Smedry's car, this one had no visible gas cap cover. I wonder what powers it. The answer of that, the answer to that, of course, was sand. Silomatic sand, to be precise. Sometimes called bright sand, but I really don't have room to go into that now. Even if its discovery was what actually led to the break between silomatic technology and or ordinary Hushlander technology, and that was kind of the foundation for the librarians breaking off from the free kingdoms and creating the Hushlands. Kind of. Old Smedry won't be here for a few more minutes, Bastille said, standing with her handbag over her shoulder. He'll be late. How does the library look? Um, like library, I said. Funny, Smedry, she said flatly. Very funny. Now, I generally know when I'm being funny. At this moment, I did not believe that I was. I looked over at the building, trying to decide what Bastille had meant. And, as I stared at it, something seemed to change about the library. It wasn't anything I could distinctly put my finger on. It simply grew darker somehow, more threatening. The windows appeared to curl slightly like horns and the stonework shadows took on a menacing cast. It looks dangerous, I said. Well, of course, Bastille said. It's a library. Right, I said. What else should I look for then? I don't know, she said. I'm no oculator. I squinted. As I watched, the library seemed to stretch. It's not just one story, I said with surprise. It looks like three. We knew that already, Bastille said. Try for less permanent auras. What does that mean? I wondered, studying the building. It now looked far larger, far more grand to my eyes. The top two floors look uh, thinner than the bottom floor, like they're squeezing in slightly. Hmm, Bastille said. That's probably a population aura. It means the library isn't very full today. Most of the librarians must be out on missions. That's good for us. Any dark windows? One, I said, noticing it for the first time. It's jet black, like it's tinted. Shattering glass, Bastille muttered. What? I asked. Dark oculator, Bastille said. What floor? Third, I said. North corner? Well, we'll stay away from there, then. I frowned. I'm guessing a dark oculator is something dangerous, right? They're like super librarians, Bastille said. Not all librarians are oculators? She rolled her eyes at me. Of course not, she said. Very few people are oculators. Smedry's on the main line and a few others. Regardless, doc dark oculators are very, very dangerous. Well then, I said, if I had something valuable like the Sands of Rashid, then I'd keep them with me, so that's probably the first place we should go. Bastille looked at me, her eyes narrowing. Just like a Smedry, if you die, I'm never going to get promoted. How comforting, I said, then nodded at the library. I'm seeing something else about the building. I think some of the windows are glowing a bit. Which ones? All of them, actually, I said, cocking my head. Even the black one. It's uh, a little strange. There's a lot of oculatory power in there. Strong lenses, powerful sands, that sort of thing. They're making the glass charge with power by association. I reached up, sliding the glasses down on my nose. I still couldn't quite tell if I was seeing actual images or if the light was just playing tricks on me. The changes were so subtle, even the stretching, that they didn't even seem like the changes at all. 
More like impressions. I pushed the glasses back up, then glanced at Bastille. You certainly seem to know a lot about this, especially for someone who says she's no oculator. Bastille folded her arms, looking away. So, how do you know all of this? I asked. About the dark oculator and the library seeming empty? Anyone would know the auras, she snapped. They're simple, really. Honestly, Smedry, even someone raised by librarians should know that. I wasn't raised by librarians, I said. I was raised by ordinary people. Good people. Oh, said Bastille. Then why did you work so hard to destroy their houses? Look, aren't knights supposed to be a little less annoying? Bastille stood upright, sniffing angrily. Then she swung her purse straight at my head. I started to remain I started but remained where I was. The handbag's strap will break, I thought. I won't be able to hit me. And so, of course, it smashed right into my face. It was surprisingly heavy as if Bastille had packed a brick or two inside, just in case she had to whack the odd Smedry in the head. I stepped backward, half from the impact, half from the surprise, and stumbled, falling to the ground. My head banged against the street lamp, and I immediately heard a crack up above. The lamp's bulb shattered on the ground beside me. Oh, sure, I thought, rubbing my head. That breaks. Bastille sniffed with satisfaction as she looked down at me, but I caught a glimmer of surprise in her eyes, as if she too hadn't expected to be able to hit me. Stop making so much noise, she said. People will notice. Beside her, Grandpa Smedry's little black car finally puttered up the street, coming to a stop beside us. I could see Sing smushed into the back seat, obscuring the entire back window. Grandpa Smedry climbed perkily out of this car and stood rubbing my jaw. As I stood rubbing my jaw, What happened? he asked, glancing at the broken light, then at me, then at Bastille. Nothing, I said. Grandpa Smedry smiled, eyes twinkling, as if he knew exactly what had happened. Well, he said, should we be off then? I nodded, straightening my glasses. Let's go break into the library. And once again, I considered just how strange my life had become during the last two hours. Rutabaga. Alrighty. And that concludes today's reading of Alcatraz vs. the Evil Librarians by Brandon Sanderson.